what most of us know about it is based on, on this 1955 film, which is a great film, but it has lots of inaccuracies in it, being given the Hollywood treatment, treatment. Not least of all, about how it portrays the death of the main character, which I'm, I'm going to talk about today, a guy called Jack Marriott, who came from just up the road. So the Dam Busters, um, I mean, it's 80 years in May this year since the Dam Buster raid, so not only is it a local history, it's a significant year as well for the Dam Busters. So it all started for me uh, a few years ago. I mean, I've always been interested in aviation and local history, so I've sort of combined the two with the two talks that I've done, done here. Um, but I've, I've done quite a lot of writing about Abro, the company, about Lancasters and about Dam Busters. And um, I was out walking with my dog one day and I happened to bump into one of my neighbours who I'd known for years but only to say hello to because our dogs never never got on. Uh, so we were never able to, in fact my dog bit her dog quite badly but by the by, she, she's forgiven me. But we got talking and I don't know how but we started talking about aeroplanes and she sort of casually mentioned that her uncle had been a dam buster who was killed on the raid. I thought, yeah, 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 we, we've all got those sorts of answers. Um, but the more she talked, the more I realised, not only did she know what she was talking about, she knew it to an incredible depth. And then she turned up with a box full of documents and I couldn't believe what I was actually seeing in this, uh, in this box. In fact, while I had them at my house, I couldn't sleep, I thought, God, if my roof leaks, I'll get burgled. They were unbelievable, but I'll, I'll come to them later. And that formed the basis for not only this talk, but a book I've written on, on, on Jack Marriott from, from Chinley and his involvement in the Dam Busters, before the Dam Busters, through the raid, the train in the raid, and then, although he died during the raid, what happened afterwards. And I got talking to lots of some of the experts in the field and some of the... Uh, other authors and things. So the book is based on what happened that night, and I suspect most of us don't really know that much about it. So the book, if anybody's interested, is called Jack Marriott, The High Peak Dam Busters. Um, so for a Lancaster, it used to take at least 50 people to get an air, one, one aeroplane airborne. There was the crew, all the ground crew, the refueling crew, the people that filled the oil, the, bomb, the people that bombed it. And so there was lots and lots of people involved. And then with all the, the, the actual staff for the airfield and the squadron people, for each squadron there's probably about 2,000 people. But most of us probably don't know that many names to do with the, uh, the Dam Buster Raid, which we'll come to in a minute. So, what do we actually know? We all know about the Dam Buster, but does anybody know what the actual operational code name for it was? Anybody? Chastise. Chastise. Operation Chastise it was. Very good. Um, I've mentioned the, the plane. It was a Lancaster. Um, it was an Avro Lancaster, but do we all know what Avro means? A.V. Roe. A.V. Roe, but the motor... Aaron. Nearly. Yeah, I can't remember. Elliot, Elliot. Elliot, yeah. Elliot Verdon Roe. He was oh. the, the guy that actually set up the company. So it was the initials of, of, of the founder. Oh, really? Um, does anybody know who actually funded him? His brother. His brother. Do you know what his name was? It was Humphrey Verdon Row, and I mention that because the factory where they first started in 1910 is still there in Manchester. It's called Brownsfield Mill. I mean, it's now just been converted into really expensive flats, but it's still there. And they were there from 1910 to 1913. They built their aeroplanes in bits and sent them down to Brooklands near London for flying. And they sort of did that with Lancasters and all the aeroplanes Avro built. They built them in bits at different factories and only assembled them eventually at, at Woodford. And uh, Humphrey actually lived in Marple, just up the road, when the, when the factory was. So this is the 1911 census, and you can see Humphrey down there, number three, living at 17 Arkwright Road in, in Marple, which is another bit of interesting local history. So, what dams did they use for training of the dam busters? We've seen one on that clip I had running. Derwin. 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 Derwin.
Yeah. Well, it's the same, really. So. Lady Bower. Well, Tell Lady Bower Dam was only just being constructed yes. when they were testing. So, um, one of the problems with that clip that I showed you was that it showed Lady Bower with water in it. When they were training, there was no water in Lady Bower at that time. It wasn't until late 1943. So, so yeah, with the Derwent, but. There was actually two others. There was the Eyebrook, uh, which is between Leicester and Peterborough, and Aberton, which was near Colchester. And those were used as much, if not more, than Derwent, although Derwent's the most famous. And what about the uh, device that they used to attack the dams? What was it? Bouncing bomb. Bouncing bomb. Well, that's what we call it. Does anybody know its proper name? Anybody know? Well, for a start, before I tell you the name of it, it wasn't a bomb, and it didn't bounce. <laughs> it was a bounce is a physical property. Um, it actually skipped, and a bomb is a device that when you release it, 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 it explodes on impact or on a timer. So some people refer to it as a mine, but a mine's a, a type of bomb that you place in a position that either um, explodes um, afterwards or um, if you go over it but what it was was actually a depth charge because it was due to explode when it went to a certain depth of water so it's actually depth charge so a skipping depth charge doesn't have the same ring does it so bouncing bomb but its name was the upkeep it was made by the vickers company so it's the vickers 464 upkeep <laughs> or bouncing bomb what about lancasters how many did they use for the raid Nineteen. That's a very good guess, that. Absolutely right. Well, well done. I've never, never had anybody guess it right the first time. Well done. They actually converted 23, but there's only 19 used on the raid. And going back to the people that were involved in it, I mean, we all know Guy Gibson, I'll give you that one, and Jack Marriott, who I've mentioned. Do we know any other names of anybody that took part that night? Bill Astle. <laughs> Bill Astle, yeah. Do you know where he came from? Yeah, Combs. Coombs, Tom. Coombs. Coombs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've lived there, live there Coombs. <laughs> yeah, Bill Astle, very good, yeah. Uh, and possibly Johnny Johnson, who died in December, the last, uh, the last ever Dan Buster, he died at 101. The point is, we don't really know that many names. Um, and there was 133 that took part that night. And what about the dams that they attacked in Germany? How many? Three. Three? Three. Five. Five. Any more? There was actually seven in the original plan. Seven. Uh, and what about number of Lancasters that didn't come home? We know that 19 took part. Eight. Eight. Well done. Is that a guess? Well, I've seen the film. <laughs> Yeah. So, so eight were lost, and there were seven aircrew to a Lancaster, so 56 men didn't come home, although three of them actually survived the crash and three were prisoners of war, so 53 died that night. And there's lots of misconceptions about the film. Um, they weren't all that experienced of crews, they weren't all handpicked by Gibson, and he didn't invent those spotlights that they used to, to judge the height um, either. So, this is our local area. Um, we're, we're over here, um, just south of Mella, and I, I, I come from Mella, and Jack came from Chilham. So this is, this is the local area. Chadderton was the factory where they made Lancasters in those bits that I mentioned. They transported them on the backs of lorries to Woodford where they were assembled, and as we've discussed, uh, the Derwent was where they did some of the training. So I've, I've called this tentatively the High Peak Dam Busters because there was three of them that came from the Peak District. Bill Astle that you mentioned from Combs, is that right? Oh. Combs. <laughs> Combs. <laughs> yeah. um, and there's a guy just off the screen there called John Nugent who came from uh, Stony Middleton, which is the, more the Peak District rather than the High Peak. And the main topic of my uh, talk tonight was with Jack Marriott who came from New Smithy. Uh, just outside Chinley on the way to Hemp Hayfield. So those are the main three, although I'm going to tell you what happened the whole of that night as it happened. 
We've got a few more on here, because there's a few more that would fit quite nicely on this map. So there's John Wilkinson from Antrobus over here in, in, in Cheshire. Uh, Leonard Easton was the wireless operator for Johnny Johnson. He came from Manchester. And there's a couple uh, that came from, from north of Manchester, all of that area. In fact, Donald Hopkinson was uh, the bomb aimers for Bill Astle. And as you know, Bill Astle was one of those that sadly didn't make it home that night. Um, so the first one I'm going to mention is the guy on the extreme right there. That's John Nugent, who came from Stony Middleton. He was a teacher before, before the war. And his pilot, um, who he stood next to, was a guy called Cyril Anderson. Uh, and they flew on the Dam's Raid. As I say, he was a teacher before the war. And then we've got Bill Astle, who come from Coombe Combs. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is him on the right. This is the house that he lived in, which is called Spire Hollins on Long Lane. Uh, this, I believe, is on Lad they sat on Ladder Hill there. Now, Bill Astor was, um, came from quite a well, or a very well-to-do family. He'd spent a lot of time uh, before the war travelling the world. He'd, uh, I think he'd studied at Leipzig University. Uh, he, he certainly was fluent in German. He was a very good pilot. Um, and he was shot down over enemy territory in, uh, in uh, 1942, at the beginning of 1942. And he was able to negotiate his way back across the minefields to get back to his squadron, um, of which he was uh, admitted to this uh, prestigious club, the Late Arrivals Club, and was given a uh, distinguished flying cross for his uh, achievements as well. So that was Bill Astle. Um, and then... Um, before I go on to Jack, I'm just going to put a few more names on here because I'll mention them a bit later. Uh, George Holden, Oldham, George Holden from Oldham, um, and Bill Winer, uh, sorry, Drew Winers from, from Alsingham, who actually played for uh, Sale Rugby Club. I'll, I'll, I'll come to them later, but they fit conveniently on, on the map. So Jack Marriott was one of six. He was the youngest. He was closest to, to his next brother, Charlie. Um, but when he was quite young, his um, mother and father got his eldest sister, Floss, to move back into to their house, which is called um, Middleton House in New Smithwick. Um, and Floss moved in with her husband, Fred, and their daughter, Norma, who is and Norma's my, my neighbour who lives in, in, uh, in Mellor. And she spoke really fondly of Jack. She actually loved him. She... Uh, she um, used to go walking with him and his girlfriend and everything. So she spoke really, really fondly about Jack. And he was quite a, a jolly, happy-go-lucky guy. Um, I don't know how clear that map is to you, but this is um, the road, Hayfield Road, where New Smith is just outside Chinley. And he came from Middleton House, which is just under the railway lines as you're going over towards Hayfield. Uh, Chinley Primary School I've marked on there, and Forge Mill, which is where Jack went to school. Uh, this is Jack on the ex second one up on the uh, extreme right there. He's uh, in about 1928. He was born in 1920. So he would have been about eight there at Chinley Primary School. And then after he left school, he worked at um, J.J. Hadfield's Forge Mill in Chinley. It was a bleach works where he, was, uh, he worked in the bleaching department. And as I say, a really happy-go-lucky guy, always messing about and joking, Norma says. Really, really good fun to be around, and these are on some of the works out in the Blackpool. But by 1940, he actually applied to join up. He went to the local recruitment section, um, it was a combined recruitment uh, section, and uh, he, he, he applied for the Royal Air Force. He did his exams and tests, and he was allocated to the ground and engineer section and sent to his first training camp. Area of Padgate, which uh, is near near Warrington, and this is Jack in his uh, in his brand new uniform. You see there is a Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve in his uniform, and he used to write home these, these wonderful letters home to his to his sister, dear Floss, and it goes on and on about what he's up to, what he's been doing, one thing and another. <coughs> After basic training. He actually was sent to the uh, number 39 maintenance unit at RF Cullern, where he learned his trade. And he specialised in airframes and engines. This is a nine-cylinder mercury radial engine. You see the classrooms working on it there with the, with the tests and, uh, and that. And he passed out and was sent to his first um, squadron, which was number 18 squadron at RF Massingham in Norfolk. And 
This is. Does anybody know what an aeroplane is? It's a plenum. It is a plenum. Yeah. Made by which company? Gloucester. Bristol. It was a Bristol blend, but most of these were actually made at Avro's in Woodford. But yeah, yeah it is a Bristol blend. It with those <laughs> nine-cylinder Mercury radial engines. That was, even though it's a Bristol one, it was actually made probably at Avro's. Um, so he worked on those for quite a while, but by the spring of 1942, these light bombers, uh, and the smaller bombers, and things like Wellingtons, Hamptons, and things like that, were being largely replaced by brand new four engine bombers. We've mentioned one, the Lancaster. Can we name any of the others? Manchester? No. The Manchester, that was an early runner, wasn't it? The Manchester was a twin engine version of the oh, Lancaster, it? yeah. Oh, it had, yeah. had really <coughs> bad engines, so they replaced it with four Merlins to become the Lancaster. So not the Manchester. Sterling. Sterling was the first of the of the four engine bombers. And the other one? Halifax. The Halifax, yeah. So, so the Sterling at the top, and the Halifax and the Lancaster were these new four engine bombers. Much more complicated, four engines, but there was a shortage of pilots, so they created a new flying role called a flight engineer to assist the pilot with the management of these you know, really complex new, new aeroplanes. And they encouraged ground engineers to apply, which Jack did, and was accepted. And he was sent to the number four school of technical training at RAF St Athens in South Wales to learn. And he was assigned to the Lancasters, which were brand new. This was early 1942. Absolutely brand spanking new, these Lancasters. And he was on one of the very, very first uh, classes for the, uh, the Avro Lancaster. This is a great picture of, of a group of new flight engineers learning the trade with the, uh, with the simulated cockpits of the Lancaster there. And there was no handouts in those days or presentations. They had to do their own drawings. This is an example of uh, a flight engineer called Wright doing his, his fuel and his uh, trim tab drawings and things like that. And at the end of it, they, they sat an exam. And they had to get a pass mark of 60% to pass. This guy got 606 6 Jack actually got 64%. Had he got 70%, he would have been um, recommended for a commission. But anybody that passed the exam was immediately promoted to air crew sergeant and given their flight engineer's brevet. So the E with the wing is the flight engineer's brevet, and you can see Jack here with his ears on. And immediately they, they became these air crew sergeants. He was then posted to his first operational squadron. Uh, which was 1654 HCU. A HCU was a conversion unit where it converted pilots that had previously flown twin engine bombers to fly these four engine ones and new flight engineers in, in the actual um, operational use of, uh, of, of them. And, and some of these HCU uh, squadrons actually went out on bombing raids, though Jack didn't seem to do that. Uh, he was on, on the squadron for a week and then he was posted to the number 50 squadron on the same airfield, which was an operational squadron. And his pilot was that Drew Wyness, the guy who I mentioned from um, Altringham, who, who played for Sale Rugby Club. And he really got on well with Drew Wyness, and had a lot of time for him, apparently. And this particular Lancaster here at the bottom, BNN, is supposed to be the most photographed Lancaster of the Second World War. So there we go, a Lancaster. It's um, got a crew of seven, as you can see. The pilot in the cockpit with a flight engineer next to him. The front gunner actually doubled up as the bomb aimer, so a dual role for him. Behind the pilot and the front flight engineer was the navigator. Um, and then behind him, the wireless operator, the mid-upper gunner, and a rear gunner. So seven, seven crews, all, all, of, all, like all of these big four engine planes, um, single pilot operation. Um, he went on his first actual bombing raid on the night of the Thursday, the 27th to 28th of August 1942, on a bombing mission to Castle. If they came back with a, a photograph over the bomb area, they were awarded these, what they call aiming point cards. And you can see the 650 Squadron and Jack's name there, third on the list. They'd obviously come back with a, a successful um, aiming. Uh, photograph from a camera that was in the nose of the Lancaster. And as I said, he used to write all the time home, and you can see 
it's addressed to, to Floss, Fred and Norma, my neighbour Norma, and he, he tells all about what he was getting up to on those, um, those missions. And his missions came thick and fast. Here's another one from Carl Grew on the 2nd of 3rd of September 1942. Um, um, and then during the October of 1942, he took part in what was known as Operation Robinson, which was a daylight low-level attack on um, the um, Schneider factory at the Crusoe in, in France. It was a heavy armaments factory, <coughs> significant because it was all done at low level and in daylight, and there was hundreds of Lancasters that took part. Apparently, it was a very successful operation, <coughs> featured in the newspapers the following day. Um, Drew Wyness is in that group of five pilots. Drew Wyness is, is Jack's pilot, the, the one on the bottom left there. And there's a group of flight engineers. Uh, of which Jack is one of them. So he went on to make 20-odd um, operations with uh, Drew Wyness, and then Drew Wyness was transferred out of the squadron. He was placed by a guy called Henry Maudsley. And uh, Jack made another four operations with Henry Maudsley. And again, Henry Maudsley, a very experienced pilot, very well-to-do family. And by March of 1943, um, Guy Gibson had been transferred from his 106 squadron and given a special task for a special uh, mission, a one-off special mission, and he formed what was known at the time as Squadron X. And all the pilots from these Lancaster bomber squadrons were encouraged to apply for this one-off special mission, and Henry Maudsley, with his complete crew, including Jack, was one of those, what we usually refer to as the Ruhr Valley although two of them uh, were actually not in the Ruhr Valley, they're in the Weser Valley, which the Weser River flows sort of northwards to the North Sea and the Ruhr uh, westwards to the North Sea. So these are the seven dams, you can just about make out the seven dams. And for the eagle-eyed amongst you, there's actually an eighth dam that's just hidden off the screen here uh, called the Beefer Dam, <coughs> which I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain what that is a bit later. So there's the seven dams in the heartland of industrial Germany that they were given the task of um, attacking. Uh, and before Jack left 50 Squadron, he had the, uh, the 50 Squadron photo, uh, and this is a picture that was taken in March of 94, early March 1943, of all the people uh, in 50 Squadron that actually were transferred to Squadron X, which became, as we know, 617 Squadron. So 26 from Jack Squadron, the 50 Squadron, were, were transferred to Scampton and Squadron X. Jack, if you can make it out, is just on the, uh, the bottom of that um, inboard uh, port uh, engine there, number two, if you can see it. So Jack, Jack's there, and um, Henry Maudsley's number one, which he, he's just below him to, to the left there. So that, that's the, the people that transferred from Jack Squadron. And as we discussed, they needed a, a special uh, conversion of the uh, Lancaster to carry this upkeep, this, the bouncing bomb. Um, I'm not going to go into all these details, but it needed significant structural changes, not least of all removing all the bomb bays uh, and they're being replaced with this uh, V-shaped caliper that held the bouncing bomb and a motor to drive it as it rotated backwards. Lots of other modifications, um, including the removal of the upper turret. Um, we, we discussed that a standard Lancaster had seven crew, pilot, flight engineer, navigator, wireless operator, bomb aimer, front gunner, mid upper gunner and rear gunner. But for these special Lancasters, their roles changed slightly. The pilot and the flight engineer remained the same, so Henry Morsley and Jack remained as pilot and flight engineer. But the navigator uh, became the guy that stood up to monitor the height using these spotlights that shone down below the Lancaster. The wireless operator also had stand up and he was operating the motor for the upkeep drive to make sure it was rotating at this 500 revs per minute. Um, the um, bomb aimer remained as a bomb aimer, but he was given special maps and he became uh, a co-navigator and a, a, a looking out for um, 
high uh, pylons and churches and things like that because they were going to fly at 100 feet all the way from their base at Scampton in Lincolnshire all across Germany and Holland uh, at 100 feet. The mid upper gunner went completely and the guy moved to the, uh, and became a permanent front gunner and then the, the rear gunner remained the same. So this is Jack's crew. The average age here was 24, which was old for a World War II bomber crew. Typically it was about 21. Um, and as we mentioned, there was um, 23, uh, sorry, there was, um, they had um, two 617 squadron as it became, uh, had two flights. Normally an area flight would have uh, eight Lancasters in it and three flights, so uh, 24 Lancasters. But for 617 Squadron, they had two flights of 10 aeroplanes with a spare, and these were the crews um, that were allocated to 617 Squadron. And you can see there that Maudsley and Jack um, were only there just four days after Gibson, so it was all happening really quickly. Assel here, number 12, just joined the day after, and then. Um, uh, where, is it? where is it? Anderson actually joined the same day as Jack. So quite soon after the formation of the squadron, crews started to arrive. So there was uh, two flights of 10 plus spares, so that's 22 crews, but they didn't all make the grade. This guy, number 13, Flight Sergeant Lancaster, was told that his navigator wasn't good enough um, and he needed to be replaced. And... Um, Lancaster apparently said to Gibson, well, if you're going to get rid of him, well, you, you might as well get rid of us all. So Gibson wasn't known for his tolerance or understanding, said, OK, off you go. So off went Lancaster back to his squadron. And Lovell uh, didn't make the grade, and he was replaced by a guy called Divel, which just left 21 crews. Initially, they borrowed 10 standard Lancasters, and some of them were fitted with uh, blue perspex over the front of the cockpit. And the pilot and flight engineer would fly them with orange goggles, and that gave the impression of flying at night during the day. Uh, and they were used quite extensively, and it was called two-stage uh, blue. The Americans used it a lot. Uh, some of the pilots complained it made them feel sick, but, uh, but it was used quite extensively. And these standard Lancasters, as I say, there was ten that they borrowed. Four of them actually stayed um, with the squadron for a little while, two of them until after the dams raid, and two of them stayed on the squadron all the way through, although one of them was lost before the end of the war, and the other one was scrapped at the end of the war. Uh, and we mentioned that with 23 of these, stand, uh, these converted Lancasters, and you can see this one quite nicely with its uh, V-shaped calipers underneath, and the drive for the uh, upkeep on the right-hand side there. And these 23 Lancasters converted, <coughs> if you remember, the top three were three test and evaluation aeroplanes. Astel was allocated AJB. Nugent, the guy from Sony Middleton, his aeroplane was AJY. Jack was in a Maudsley, was allocated AJX. Does anybody know what Gibson's was? Possibly the most famous registration or code. Anybody? AJG, and the reason that he chose that apparently was because it was the initials of his father, Alexander Jane Gibson. So, and the dams that they uh, they were going to attack, there was two different types of dams. <coughs> there were the, these gravity dams, uh, like the, 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 there was five of those: the Myrna, the Ada, the Lister, the Enica, and the Demo. These were a bit like the the Derwent Dam. Um, the aeroplane would approach the dam perpendicular to the face of the dam at a height of 60 feet at a speed of 220 miles an hour and then with the upkeep rotating anti-clockwise it was 500 rpm at about 450 yards from the dam it would release the upkeep which would then skip across the water avoiding torpedo nets hit the dam wall and the rotation would keep it in contact with the dam wall. It would then drop to about 30 feet when hydrostatic pistols would ignite the torpex, the explosive within that, and that's why there's a depth charge. So these are the gravity dams. As I say, like the, the Derwent and the Howden, gravity dams. 
And then the other type of dam was these earth dams, like the Toddbrook that we had problems with the other year. They were earth dams. And for that, it was a completely different technique. The aeroplane wouldn't approach perpendicular to the dam, but it would fly along the parapet of the dam as low as it could, as slow as it could, and then as near to the centre of the dam as possible, they would release the upkeep without it spinning. It would then roll to the depth of 30 feet and then explode. So these are the, uh, the earth-type dams, of which there was two, the Zorpi, the Henny, and this beaver dam, this eighth dam. So they didn't need the, the, the lights underneath the aeroplane to these earth-type dams. This is a great picture of, uh, of one of the uh, converted line cutters, and you see clearly the V-shaped calipers there and the drive motor. <laughs> and um, they did extensive testing, obviously, with these, but it wasn't the squadron pilots that did the testing. It was actually Vickers who designed the bomb, or Avro test pilots who did all the testing of, of the bombs. And here's one being released. The initial versions had a wooden casing around it, but they settled on this, this drum shape uh, upkeep. It was 50 inches in, uh, in diameter and six feet, six feet wide, and weighed four and a half tons. So you can see there one being released. Um, and the tests were done at a place called Recul Reculver off the Kent coast. As I say, the pilots from the squadron didn't do any testing, but on the 12th of May, uh, just four days before the actual raid, some of the pilots were given the opportunity at Reculver to test dropping a dummy upkeep. And this is actually uh, Jack's navigator's logbook. And you can see the first four or five entries are in standard Lancasters. Then on 12th of May, he does his exercise of um, uh, two hours, 10 minutes, uh, after which they actually revert to a standard Lancaster. But on the 12th of May, several of the pilots were given this opportunity to, to test drop at the Culver. Um, and this is what, this is an official ministry um, film, and it shows the Lancaster approaching. You see the upkeep rotating anti-clockwise as it skips towards the shore. Now watch out for the health and safety as it gets to the beach. So this is four and a half tons of steel and concrete. Incredible. The guy waving his hands is Barnes Wallace, the guy that actually designed the, 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 the bouncing ball. And the guy, second from the left, is actually Guy Gibson. That was a successful test drop, but it wasn't that easy. Those spotlights that they shone down worked great at night to give them the 60 feet, but during the day they were absolutely useless. So there were quite a few failed tests, and this is actually... Henry Maudsley flying with Jack in, in their aeroplane, which at that time was AJX. And you can see as, as the upkeep hits the water, the plume of water smashes into the back of the aeroplane, and it caused such severe damage on AJX that they weren't able to use it on the raid. And they were allocated. Well, for the first couple of days afterwards, they, they flew in standard Lancasters, but then they were allocated the very last Lancaster to arrive, which was AJZ. That may have had an impact on Gibson's opinion of Maudsley. We, we, obviously, we don't know, but uh, it's said that he wasn't very pleased with him. So on the night of the raid, which was the 16th, 17th of May, 1943, 80 years ago this May, um, 19 crew were selected. Two of them didn't make it. The um, uh, Dibble and Wilson, they didn't make the, the grade, or they were ill. But for whatever reason, there was 19 <coughs> Um, pilots chosen for, for the operation, um, which is fortunate because they only had 19 aeroplanes. Jack's AJX was damaged so badly, they were allocated AJZ, as I said. The first three were tests and evaluation, but during the morning of the attack of the raid, 16th of May 1943, AJT was actually flown up from Farnborough, where it had been used for test and evaluation just in case they needed a spare. You know, it wasn't fitted with the spotlight altimeters that shone down or anything like that, uh, but it was flown up as a spare. And of the 19 crew, uh, they were gonna fly off in three waves. Wave one of nine aeroplanes, we're gonna fly in this three ship Vic formation, separated by about 10 minutes. 
Jack, as you can see, was um, leading off the third uh, flight of Wave 1. And their task was to attack the Mourner Dam uh, until it was destroyed. Then anybody that had still got any upkeeps would carry on to the Ada Dam. And then any that had got any upkeeps that hadn't been used onto the Sorpy Dam. Wave 2 of five aeroplanes were going to fly line abreast, as you can see here. Um, uh, just going back to that one, Astral was also in that third flight of Wave 1. Uh, wave 2, five aeroplanes line abreast. Their sole task was to attack the Sorpy Dam. Wave 3 um, were going to be used as a mobile reserve. They were going to take off much later than the other two waves and would be directed to whatever dams they thought uh, would be the most important after wave one and wave two had completed their attacks. And Anderson uh, with Nugent from Stony Middleton were in that wave three. There were dedicated outward and return routes. Wave one and wave three, we're gonna take a south, uh, a route south over, the, um, over, over East Anglia to a so roughly over South Wall, then across the North Sea to the Shell Estuary, across Holland, then into Germany, and then onto the dams. Wave two, we're going to take a slightly further northerly route, um, almost due east from uh, Scampton, the base, out over Mablethorpe, towards the, um, the Frisian Islands, and then down through Holland to meet up with uh, wave one, uh, roughly the same time as they approached to Germany. So they were going to take off much earlier because they had further to go. Um, this is um, a picture of uh, a reconstruction of a special Lancaster that was used for the, for the dams raid. So during the afternoon, all the crews would have been testing uh, their, their, their equipment, checking out their engines and, and airframes, and that the upkeep was loaded successfully. And one of the pilots, a guy called Mickey Martin, or Harold Martin was his real name, um, was showing uh, one of the wafts around uh, the cockpit during the afternoon. Um, to release the upkeep, the bomb aimer had an electronic release, the pilot had a secondary electronic release, but there was an, an emergency, they had this, this handle at the, the front installed, so it was a manual release of the upkeep just in case the electronic ones didn't work. When he was showing this waff around, as she was getting out, she, she, she actually pulled that release and released the upkeep from the Lancaster onto the hard standing. And apparently it was the fastest ever evacuation of a Lancaster ever seen. <laughs> it wasn't fused, so it wasn't a problem. The armaments guy came and, and they got it all reinstalled and it was no mean task to put these upkeeps on. It was a big, big thing to do. Um, but it may have had an effect on, on, the, on, on the upkeep later, as, you, as you'll see. So that, that was a bit of uh, action in the afternoon. Um, and then they had all the briefings. The flight takeoff time was set for nine o'clock. And this is one of only two known photographs of the actual night. This is actually Guy Gibson's crew getting into the, uh, to the Lancaster with Gibson in the doorway there. Um, as they, nine o'clock, they were gonna set off. A red very light was fired into the air for waves one and waves two to start their engines. And Jack got into his office. So this is Jack's office. Um, the pilot sat on the left with his blind flying panel in front of him. The flight engineer with all of the controls, the throttles, the boost levers, all the gauges for the RPM and boost, startup, magneto, things like that. That was Jack on the right there. But he also had a panel behind him on the right hand side, on the starboard side of the uh, cockpit behind him, with all the fuel contents, on oil stuff, the fuel cocks and things like that. So he had two, two areas that he had to work on. Um, and typically, um, well, the, the flight engineer didn't even have a proper seat, he just had this little fold up thing with a, with a canvas strap that went across the back. Um, and I'm told that most flight engineers chose not to use those on a flight because they had to sort of get between the, the panel in the front and the panel at the back. Uh, and none of the, uh, the air crew other than the pilot had any harness of them either, so quite incredible really. So what I'm gonna do now is step you through that night uh, of what happened. There's a bit of a dashboard on the right, I know it's not that clear, but uh, um, I'll, I'll walk you through what happened. So. 
the start of at Scampton at 9 o'clock on the 16th of May. Wave 2 take off just after half past 9. As I say, they take off first because they've got slightly further to go. But as they start the engines, the American pilot, Joe McCarthy, couldn't start one of his engines and he was desperate to go. So what he did, he made his crew get into that spare one that had flown up early on in the afternoon um, uh, to get into that one because he, he wanted to make sure that he, he went on the raid. But they couldn't take off because they have a thing called a compass deviation card. So they actually set the instruments with the upkeep on and then with off, with it off, so they can adjust them accordingly for the flight home. And they couldn't find it. So this McCarthy apparently is quite foul mouthed, furious, screaming at all the, the ground crew till they found till they actually found it, which delayed him even further. When he grabbed his parachute, he grabbed it by the ripcord and not by the handle, and his parachute went billowing out across the airfield, which just infuriated him even more, apparently. Anyway, they got him a spare one, uh, but he was still quite a bit behind the rest of them. The first plane off was Barlow in AJE, and the only other known picture that night is believed to be Barlow taking off. Um, I think it's been heavily censored because the upkeep's been got painted out, but this is the only one, the only known other picture of, of that night. So by about quarter to 11, <coughs> wave one have got out over the North Sea. And remember, they're going down, flying all the way at 100 feet. Wave two took off slightly earlier. They're also approaching the Holland, but further north with McCarthy's plane catch up. He's off airborne by this time. As wave one go out across the North Sea, they, t they drop down from 100 feet <coughs> down to 60 feet to make sure that the lights are working. Now, um, the pilot Knight in AJM has uh, recorded that when he was down at 60 feet, Maudsley looked like he was considerably lower uh, testing his light. So, again, maybe something there that's significant later on. We're now at about 11 o'clock. Gibson's uh, three ship Vic has passed into, into Holland. But as wave two approached the Dutch coast further north, um, some unforecast wind has blown them slightly, slightly further south than they were expecting to be. And um, Byers in AJK is hit quite badly by flak and is shot down, killing all seven crew members. Munro in AJW is also hit quite badly, but he's not shot down and he circles to assess the damage. Behind them, a guy called Rice in AJH sees what's happening, puts his nose even further down, and as he does so, he, he hits the sea with the underside of his Lancaster. It rips off the upkeep, it smashes into the back of the aeroplane, damages all, in fact, it rips off the tailwheel, smashes into the back of the aeroplane, so he has to turn for home. Um, Munro does his assessment. He, he finds he's got a huge hole in the back of his Lancaster. His master compass is, 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 is useless, so he has no option but to turn for home. So out of five aeroplanes from wave two, three are, are not going to be able to make the mission. One shot down and two are returning for home, which just leaves the two from wave two. By this, at the same time, Gibson's three ship Vic, when they've been forecast, he breaks radio silence to notify all the other aeroplanes that there's significant flak in that particular area of, of Germany. Sadly, uh, Barlow is hit by that flak. Uh, this is about um, uh, 10, to, 10 to 12, 10 to midnight. Barlow is the second aeroplane to be shot down. Um, which means wave two is down now to a single aeroplane, Munro. Barlow, though, hadn't fused his upkeep, which bounced clear of the aeroplane. The aeroplane is totally destroyed, killing the seven crew members, but the upkeep bounces clear and is captured by the Germans, who reverse engineer it within a matter of weeks, develop their own bouncing bomb. <laughs> We're now, we're now at about quarter past midnight. Wave one with Gibson has arrived at the Mona Dam. Uh, McCarthy in AJT has 
and Wave 2, the only Wave 2 aeroplane, has arrived at the Soapy Dam a bit further south. Maudsley's Queen Ship Vic clearly had some problems. It was supposed to be led by Maudsley with Knight and Astel on his wings, but around about this time, it appears that Knight was in the lead, Maudsley was behind, and Astel was some way behind. And as he tried to play catch up, he missed seeing some power cables, and his aeroplane flew into these power cables and power, power lines, totally destroying his aeroplane and exploding the upkeep. So this is Bill Astle, who came from Combs. Combs? Coombs. Combs. Yeah. Uh, sadly, um, all his seven crew members were killed. This gory picture is the following day with the wreckage of Bill Astle's uh, Lancaster. And there is a memorial in Chinley for, on the, you know, the more in the centre of the town, you can see Bill Astle's name, and he's got his name in the church as well, just behind there as well. So that's the uh, wreckage of his aeroplane. Um, so we're after almost approaching about half past one now. Um, all but Astle and, uh, sorry, Morsley and Knight have arrived at the Mona Dam. McCarthy is at the Soapy Dam, and you remember this is one where they're flying along the parapet of the dam, finding it incredible, no flat, but finding it incredibly hard to, uh, to get the right height, the right speed, the right distance, uh, and one thing or another. So he, he, he's making attempt after attempt at the Soapy Dam. At the, um, the Mona Dam, Gibson makes a dummy run. So those that have arrived circle, they make an orbit to the south <coughs> of uh, the Mona Reservoir, um, and then Gibson makes a dummy run over the Mona Dam uh, to assess the, uh, the, the defences and the significant amounts of flak. He then went on to make his actual attempt, Gibson, and as he came in, his upkeep was seen to bounce up four or five times, and then it sank about 50 yards short of the dam and exploded. He then called in Hopgood. Now Hopgood had actually been damaged on the way over. He'd actually lost an engine where he experienced that flak as he entered Germany. And as he uh, made his approach, he was hit again and again and again. One of his fuel tanks exploded. Uh, so he pulled up trying to gain height to, to get his crew to bail out, of which three of them managed to bail out. Um, but the rest, sadly, uh, were, were killed. And this is the wreckage the following morning. Of those three that bailed out, uh, two of them survived uh, and became prisoners of war. Sadly, the other one uh, didn't. Uh, just after this, Maudsley arrives at the Mona Dam. Um, Rice and Munro by this time have got home, and Wave 3 are now airborne, heading for Germany by the same route as Wave 1. Martin, Harold Martin, is then called in to make his attack on the dam. And if you remember, he's the guy whose upkeep had dropped off early in the morning. Um, and as he approached, it looked like it was a great approach, but his upkeep veered off to the left and exploded on the shores before the dam. So again, an unsuc unsuccessful um, attempt. He then called in um, Young, and uh, Young made his uh, approach, and as he did so, Gibson and Martin flew alongside him, flashing the lights and machine guns uh, to act as decoys. And he made a perfect, uh, made a perfect approach, and his upkeep bounced, hit the dam at the right place, and sank. And it's believed that it started to crack the dam at that point. Over at the Soapy Dam at the same time, this is, remember, they, they're flying <coughs> along the parapet of the dam as low as they could, the actual bomb aimers, this Johnny Johnson who died last month, or in December, sorry, as low as possible, as slow as possible, um, with the upkeep not, uh, not spinning, and they made a successful drop on the ninth attempt. And uh, in, in John Johnson's book, he said they were down at 30 feet when they actually released it. Um, but it didn't destroy the dam. It made significant uh, damage to the parapet of the dam, but it didn't destroy the dam. Back at the Mona, after Martin uh, and Young, Maltby was called in, and again, protected by uh, um, Martin and, and Gibson as he made his approach. He made an approach to the dam, perfect, hit the dam in the middle, and as we know, the dam crumbled and the Mona dam was breached. 
At about one o'clock, Gibson sends a message back to base that the, uh, the Mona Dam is breached. Um, he then sends Martin and Maltby home, but asks Young to accompany him with, with uh, Shannon, Knight and Maudsley to the Ava Dam. Uh, and by this time, the uh, Wave 3 are almost at the Dutch coast. About half past one, further down here, Gibson arrives at the Ada Dam. The, uh, the route to the Mona Dam across Holland and that part of Germany was quite flat and it was easy to navigate along canals and one thing and another. But between the Mona and the Ada, it was quite hilly terrain with lots of valleys and high trees and little villages. And they found it really difficult to get um, to the Mona, uh, from the Mona to the Ada and they went individually. Gibson arrives first at the, the western end of the, uh, the Ada and he follows this snaking canal all the way till he finds the dam at the far end there. Um, now, the terrain around it was really steep-sided, high, high valleys and uh, there's a village at the top of a mountain there and really difficult terrain, but no flak significantly, no flak at all. But he, when he arrives, he um, is confused because nobody else is there and nobody turns up for a little while. And eventually he breaks radio silence again and asks people where they are. Shannon says, well, I'm just about to release my up cake, but he was lined up on the Rayback Dam. So Gibson sends up another flare and within minutes, all the other aeroplanes, Morsley, Knight, Shannon and Young all arrive and they circle <coughs> just to the, um, east, to the northeast of the... Uh, of the dam uh, over the town of Baldeck. Now that's about a thousand feet. So they've got to get down a thousand feet down to 60 feet as they approach the dam. And to make matters worse, there's a spit of land that sticks out just before the dam that's got high sides and really tall trees on it. So really, really, really difficult, but no, no flat. Now I'm going to show you a little clip from the film which shows the attack on the Ada Dam. And significantly, it shows the attack from Henry Maudsley with our guy Jack, Ma Jack Marriott. Um, one of the errors in the film is that they actually showed them coming as a group, but they didn't. They went individually.
Let's come down from a thousand feet, get the speed right, get the height right, get the engines right, get down to 60 feet, over that spit of land, and then approach the dam. that was how it was shown in the film. It's not what happened. In, in, in Gibson's book, he actually says he was surprised because there was no burning aeroplane in the sky. That, that explosion on the dam did happen. The upkeep did land on the parapet of the dam and explode, which obviously damaged the aeroplane. But Gibson said there was no burning aeroplane in the sky. There was no burning wreckage on the ground. Henry Maudsley had just disappeared. So they didn't know what happened to him. Anyway. This is a, a, a painting that shows the, the, the approach from the right side, so rather than the left side as it was shown in the film. And you can see they flew down this valley at the side of Castle Valde, getting down from a thousand feet. <coughs> Steep turn and then an approach into the dam. Um, so Shannon eventually made another approach and his, uh, his upkeep was accurate. Um, Henry's obviously had exploded on the parapet of the dam and then Knight was called in and he made an, an accurate uh, approach and the dam was breached. So the second dam was breached. And it's believed that Shannon took probably six attempts before he released his, up, up, his upkeep and Jack possibly two or three and Knight again two or three attempts before they actually released the upkeep. So so difficult, incredible flying what they had to do these guys. Um, by this time we're now at about 10 to uh, 2. Um, the wave 1 have all had its finished at the Mona and the Ada and have turned for home. McCarthy is on his way home after bombing the Sophie and uh, Maltby and, um, uh, and um, Martin are also on the way home. But wave 3 are actually crossing Holland and Burpee in AJS is dazzled by searchlights and flies into the ground, uh, sadly again killing all seven crew members. So they're down to four aeroplanes now. Um, at just around about this time, Gibson sends the, uh, the signal that the Ada Dam has been breached. And then, at about 20 past two, Townsend in AJO is ordered to attack the Enipi Dam Brown in AJF and Anderson with our guy from Stony Middleton, John Eugene in AJY to attack the Sorpy Dam and Otley in AJC is asked to attack the Lister Dam but by this time he'd strayed over um, a very heavily defended town which was Ham in Germany and he was shot down burn, burning in flames. Uh, the rear gunner was actually blown clear although badly burned, actually survived to become the third prisoner of war. Uh, and then just after half past two, Maudsley hadn't crashed at the Ada Dam, had struggled back to their turning point, the waypoint of this town at Rees on the Rhine, where they should have turned north up into Holland. Um, now it should have taken him about half an hour from the Ada Dam to get there, and it had taken him more than 15 minutes so we don't know how much damage was done to the aeroplane, we don't know how uh, injured any of the crew were, but for some reason he didn't turn to the north, he headed straight for this heavily defended oil town of Emmerich on the Rhine. And as he approached it, their flak teams were ready and waiting. So those on the uh, eastern side of the town spotted the Lancaster and they just opened up with everything they'd got and the report said that they were firing so low they were taking the tops off the trees beyond um, and Jack's aeroplane didn't stand a chance um, and it crashed killing Jack and his six crew members uh, in this field near Emmerich on, on the Rhine 
um, and this is uh, the photograph the following day of Jack's aeroplane. Um, just after this, this we were now talking at, at um, about three o'clock. Um, Brown's arrived at the Sopi. Townsend is struggling to find the Enipi Dam, and Anderson has got problems with his uh, hydraulics and some of his equipment and his navigational equipment, and is hopelessly lost. At the same time, Young, as he crosses the uh, the Dutch coast, is hit by flak. And sadly, him and his crew are all killed as they are on their last leg home. And this is his aeroplane the following morning on a sandbank. Uh, as I say, no survivors for Young and his crew. Um, at about 10 past three, Anderson, who's hopelessly lost, got problems with his hydraulics and what, decides to turn for home, <coughs> complete with his upkeep. Brown um, attacks the Sorpy after making six or seven attempts at it, as Munro had. Uh, sorry, McCarthy had. Again, it's successful in exploding. Superficial damage to the parapet of the dam, but it doesn't get breached. And then um, Townsend in AJO drops on what he believes to be the Enipi Dam, but the actual fact is probably the Bifa Dam uh, that I mentioned earlier. So he, he drops it in completely the wrong dam. But anyway. And then soon after this, all aeroplanes that are still airborne are on the way home. And by four o'clock, Gibson is nearly home, and he actually lands at quarter past four after a flight time of about six and a half hours. For a World War II bombing mission, it's not particularly long, but given what he had to do, and he managed all the attacks on the moon and the Adi Dam, flying as decoy at 60 feet there and back and everything. It's an unbelievable achievement. And Gibson at the time was only 24. Um, Anderson lands back at half past five with Don Nugent from Sony Middleton, complete with his upkeep. And Gibson, as I mentioned, he's not known for his tolerance or understanding. He said, you were given a task to do. You didn't do it. And he immediately sacked him and sent him from the squadron back to his, uh, his, own, his, his uh, donating squadron. Um, the last one home is at quarter past six, and that's Townsend. All the aeroplanes have been really hammered, some of them quite badly shot up, but really hammered. And this is a summary of, of, those, uh, of what happened that evening with the eight that with the, sadly didn't come back out of the 19. 53 casualties, three prisoners of war, 11 got home safe, and they used 11 out of the 19 upkeeps of. So that's summary. Um, clip now of the very, very last sequence of the film. Uh, when they got back, there was a bit of a party in the officers' mess, but Gibson left early. And this is. Uh, this is Barnes. Is it true? All of the fellow lost. Only two aircraft went down the attacks. That was Hopkins over there and Morton's over the air. Aspore got it soon after crossing the coast. And Dingy Young was shot down over the sea on his way home. The rest we don't know about. They've been falling them since midnight, but they haven't answered. The flak was bad, worse than I expected. Fifty-six men. If I'd known it was going to be like this, I'd, I'd never have started it. Now, you mustn't think that way. If all these fellows had known from the beginning they wouldn't be coming back, they'd have gone for it just the same. There isn't a single one of them would have dropped out. I knew them all. I know that's true. You had a worse night than any of us. Why don't you go and find the doctor and ask for one of his sleeping pills? Aren't you going to turn in, Gibby? No, I, I have to write some letters first. So, the very last scene from the film. But it isn't the end of the story for Jack. He's off there to write letters. And this was one of those ripped letters. It's a, a telegram from Gibson to the Marriott family, <laughs> saying, deeply regret to inform you that your son, Sergeant J. Marriott, is missing as a result of operations on the night, 16th and 17th of May, 43. Letter follows. Please accept my profound sympathy. OC, Operation 617 Squadron. And the letter that he promised is this one. And these, this is, these are some of the documents that Norma um, uh, 
showed to me, and it was incredible. You see Gibson's signature at the bottom. Although it's a standard, um, you know, letter from the Air Ministry type of letter, it actually gives a, a, a sort of personal observation of what he'd seen. It says, Sergeant Marriott was flight engineer of an aircraft detailed to carry out an attack against the Ava Dam. The aircraft was seen to drop its load, and when the captain, squadron leader Henry Mosley, was made uh, was called by radio, he seemed to be in extreme difficulty, which is, is quite significant, I think. It's incredible, really, that personal observation. And he mentions this in his book as well. Um, this was then followed by a standard letter from the Air Ministry saying that, you know, he's, he's missing, and while we've heard nothing else, there is hope that he still may be found. He was replaced by the guy to his left there. This was George Holden from Oldham. Again, and not, he wasn't particularly well liked, but uh, he, he became the new 617 Squadron uh, uh, commander. Uh, in fact, some of the Air Gibson's crew refused to fly with him, but very, very decorated. Um, and then, on the 11th of August, the International Red Cross had received a notification from the German authorities uh, that Jack had sadly been killed, and this is that confirmation that they received via the Red Cross. Um, and then that was followed by a letter by George Holden, the new 617 Squadron commander to the Marriott family, expressing his profound sympathies. Jack was actually buried at the uh, Nordfriedhof, the Northern Military Cemetery in Dusseldorf. He was only Jack and one other crew member that were identified. The other five crew members were temporarily buried in a, in a grave together. And Jack. Jack's family received this letter from Maudsley's mother. Um, as I say, the, Mo the Maudsleys were a very well-to-do family. And this is a letter from uh, Henry Maudsley's mother. It says, um, I write to you as the mother of your son's pilot in the glorious but fated dam operation, how I hoped and prayed they might all be safe somewhere in those agonizing weeks of waiting. Now we have to face life without them. Henry was so proud of his crew what we owe to all their young lives, so full of bravery and courage, is immense. I feel I must be as brave as they were. Please accept my great sympathy, Susan Gwen Maudsley. So, a, a unique letter, I think, really. Uh, this was then followed by an official Air Ministry confirmation of death and um, a standard <coughs> letter from um, was it George the Sixth, with this George, George the Sixth, George the Fifth. So, well, anyway, the king, a letter from the king uh, with his condolences. <coughs> uh, and, and then, I mean, obviously the war continued, and of those 133 that took part, 53 had died. Before the end of the war, another 32 of that squadron had died. After the war, uh, the Marriott family got a letter to say that Jack had been awarded a medal, but not for his time with 617 squadron, the Dam Busters, but from his time with 50 squadron before, um, and he was awarded a, a distinguished flying medal uh, with his citation saying that it was for his efficiency and enthusiasm in, in operational flying and his determination in helping to hit the enemy targets. So he was awarded the VFM. Um, he, around about this time, this is now about 1948, um, the Imperial War Graves Commission decided they were going to create these mass graveyards to bring together all these soldiers and airmen that had been killed at various battlefields and around Germany into, uh, into, into uh, purpose-built uh, military cemeteries. And Jack was being moved from Dusseldorf to a place called Reichswald Forest Military Cemetery, uh, which was near Cleve in Germany, only about 10 miles from where he'd actually been shot down. And you can see Jack's temporary grave there, uh, individual. By this time, a couple more had been identified, but three of them were still together in, in, in the grave. And those temporary graves, grave markers, were replaced by the standard RAF issue ones in about 1950. And this is Jack's complete with his DFM on it. Um, after, the ga after the dams raid, Gibson, I say, he didn't fly operation with 617 Squadron. He actually did a tour of America where he became quite a celebrity. He wrote various articles for uh, these American magazines which were brought together after he was actually killed on operations in, in 1944. But they brought them together uh, and they published this book called Enemy Coast Ahead, which is a great book. He, as I say, he mentions 
Worsley and, and the attack on the Avia in it. Um, it's a great book, but uh, most of it is about his time before 617 Squadron, only the last few pages really about 617 Squadron. That was though elaborated on by a guy called Paul Brickhill, who called it the Dam Bosses, and he, he, he makes it sort of a bit more interesting and there's more information about 617 Squadron after the Dam Bosses and one thing and another. Uh, and by this time, a film company was obviously interested in it. And one of the other unique letters uh, that uh, Norma's got is this letter from the uh, film company, the Associated British Picture Corporation. And it's a letter saying that basically we, we're making this film about the Dam Busters raid, of which we portray your son in it. Would you like to read through the script to make sure you're happy with the, the way we portray it? They were, although it's completely wrong, they were honestly happy with the way it was being portrayed. But uh, again, a, another unique document. Um, this is one of the original posters from the film in 1955. Uh, Richard Todd, as we've seen, plays Guy Gibson and uh, Michael Redgrave, uh, Barnes Wallace. Um, and Jack's family were sent an invitation to the premiere, which was going to be on the um, uh, 16th of May 1955, 12 years to the day after the raid. Uh, they were to be given two tickets, of which one of them was allowed to meet the guest of honour, which was Princess, the Princess Royal, uh, Princess Margaret. Um, as I say, the premiere was on the 16th of May 1955 at the Empire Theatre at Leicester Square. Uh, and the picture shows Guy uh, Barnes Wallace and Guy Gibson's dad, Alexander James Gibson, um, meeting some of those dignitaries. Jack, though, is commemorated on the Chinley um, War Memorial at Woodall Spa, which was uh, where 617 Squadron were based for a long time after they moved out to Scampton. There's a memorial for 617 Dambusters Squadron uh, with uh, a representation of a dam with a breach in it, and all the names are on it. This is Jack's DFM that Norm has donated to 617 Squadron, in, uh, which is currently operational again. Uh, it's also mentioned at the Memorial Arboretum in, in Staffordshire. Uh, this is Norma visiting the, uh, the, the, the memorial. And for a long time, Jack's aeroplane was the only one that had been shot down that didn't have a permanent memorial. And for a while, this, this appeared in the field where Jack's plane had been shot down. I mean, it's a clear representation of a Lancaster with a registration on it and the seven uh, poppies for the aircrew and the day. Uh, but nobody knew who had done it or why they'd done it. And the local newspapers and television had this big campaign to try and find out what <coughs> and why it had been done. And it turns out that uh, there was a Dutch pilot who lived just across the border, and he believed that Maudsley had purposely crashed in that field to stop his Lancaster crashing onto the village where he lived, which would have caused more civilian death casualties. Now, whether that's true or not, obviously we don't know. But by this time, a, a German aviation historian and a British aviation historian had decided to put a permanent memorial up and they'd, they'd raised enough money. And um, it, it was unveiled in, on the 17th of May in 2019. This is this guy's Marcel Haar, a German aviation historian, together with Mark Welsh, uh, a British one. But the guest of honor was the guy in the middle of the microphone there, a guy called Johannes Dervold. And as a 16-year-old, he was, he, he was awarded for actually shooting down Jack's aeroplane. So he, he was the guest of honour there. And Norma was taken over as a guest. You can see her laying a, a white rose against the memorial and a picture of her there in front of the uh, plaque. And she was also given a piece of Jack's aeroplane so this is an actual piece of AJZ that was, uh, you know, Jack's last flight. But interestingly, I mean, we, we, we're, um, we're, we're doing a commemoration at Woodford in, in May for the 80th anniversary. And Norma's uh, document and this piece of Lancaster will be on display at Woodford. So it will be going home for the first time in 80 years. So it's quite interesting, really. She also visited... Um, uh, Jack's grave at the Reichsfeld Military Cemetery. And then another memorial appeared on Jack's house where he lived. It's called Middleton House, as I mentioned, in New Smithy. 
and this plaque appeared on the wall, which is a commemoration for, for Jack. I mean, Jack's real name is John, he was known to Jack as his fam to his family. Um, and for a while, nobody knew who or why it had been put there or who'd done it. And I knocked on for quite some time. And just before the book was published, I managed to meet the owner of the house, who's actually in the audience tonight. But, and he'd found out that Jack had actually lived there, and he um, had this created out of his own pocket to commemorate the fact that Jack, the dam buster, had lived in that particular house in New Smithy, which is a lovely, uh, a lovely lot of things here. Just very quickly, this is a summary of the number of crews that took part and all the medals that were, were awarded for that night. Nothing was awarded posthumously. And the only thing I would say is that uh, if I was the flight engineer of Townsend, I'd be a bit peeved really when all the other rest of the crew was given the medal, but uh, not, not that one. One BC, of course, which was for, for Gibson. Um, and, and then some stats about the, uh, the numbers of crews involved. Of the Lancasters, <coughs> all I'm going to say is that by 1947, every single one had been scrapped. Nothing was saved other than um, this control yoke and throttle quadrant were from Guy Gibson's aeroplane, AJZ, and they're uh, preserved at East Kirby, where there's a Lancaster that you can go and, well, you can pay to go and sit in and have a ride in. Uh, and that's it, really. That's the story of Jack Marriott and the Night of the Dam Bus. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Very. Nothing difficult. <laughs> was it the little bit of wood with the nails that they used on the film? Was that a true thing? <laughs> yeah, it was true. Yeah, it was like uh, it, it, basically they they when they looked through it. it that lined up with the two towers yeah. on the um, the Mona and the Ada, this, this tower. So it, 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 it told them they were at um, 450 yards. However, not all the bomb aimers preferred. They didn't like it. They had their own way. If they had a bit of string and mm -hmm. and uh, pencil on the uh, you know the blister at the front, so it was used by some. For all the attacks on the Soapy Dam, they didn't need that because they were flying along. But yeah, it, it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm.